Uh, okay, so I thought uh, this morning we'd have um, a look at the um, technology aspects of network engineering. Um, and so I thought there are two aspects of that that are coming to the fore at the moment and I'd get speakers to talk about. Uh, both from warehouse scale computing. Um, the first is pretty obviously software defined networking and I've got two speakers on that this morning. And the second is the hardware itself used for warehouse scale computing. It's a bit different than the hardware that um, you might buy at the moment. Um, and so I've got a speaker on that as well. Um, so the first speaker and his colleague, uh, the first speaker is Vijay Savaraman from UNSW. Uh, and his colleague, who's not speaking but will be at the demonstration this evening uh, during drinks, is Craig Russell from Data 61, isn't it? And Syro. Um, I asked them both for a quick bio so that it's more up to date than my webpage. Um, VJ's was that he got his PhD at UCLA in 2000, uh, has worked at a Silicon Valley startup, and is now a professor at UNSW. Uh, he's been working on SDN for a few years um, and has led the development of a couple of proof of concept demos. Um, his most recent look, he's, he's looking at the use of SDN for security analytics, uh, especially around the Internet of Things. As you all know, it's deeply insecure, so um, VJ's work there is welcomed. Uh, Craig Russell is Principal Research Engineer at Cyrus Data 61. He's got a PhD in mathematics, which is a bit of an achievement. Oh, my God from Macquarie, uh, worked as a, subs as a network engineer for a tier two Twelco and a software engineer for another company before joining Syro. Uh, he too has been developing proof of concept demonstrators for the last four years for SDN and his interest is in the application of SDN to cyber security and network analytics. I've asked Craig and Vijay to give an overview of software defined networking, a uh, description of OpenFlow and a quick walkthrough of the demonstrators that they've been developing for the past two years. So, Vijay, it's all yours, mate. Where is Vijay? Ah, I need to speak for longer. Okay, in that case, I can speak to the demonstrators that are on this evening. Um, there are three demonstrations, as I just said. There's Vijay's work. Um, we're lucky enough to have the Fawcett um, SDN controller give a demonstration. And... I wanted to show you the actual um, equipment used in warehouse scale computing, so I contacted one of the manufacturers of that equipment called Edgecore, um, and they've been really generous and have um, imported direct from their factory one of their higher end boxes, a 32 port, 100 gigs thing. Uh, they run ONI on that, uh, and on that you can choose what software load you run on the actual switch itself. Uh, so we're going to run one that implements OpenFlow, and we've just been chatting amongst ourselves saying, well, we have these two stands next to each other, the, float, the Fawcett OpenFlow controller and the EdgeCore OpenFlow switch. Can we make them work together despite the fact that they've just met each other? And the answer is, by the time of the demo, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, you know, if you think about a multi-vendor environment, normally it takes more than an afternoon's work to get them to work together successfully. So that's really encouraging that the promises of the um, new ecosystem are actually backed by reality. So Vijay's now up the front, so it's all yours, mate. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Glenn. And uh, I apologise for coughing a bit, so I might burst into fits of coughing. But uh, I also apologise even more for not being able to do the live demos, which I was hoping I'd be able to do, because for some reason my MacBook is not able to display on the screen. So <coughs> anyway, um, let's see if you can actually have the demo driven from the back to some extent. If not, um, we will be setting up the booth outside, and at, uh, at drinks time, you're more than welcome to come and, come and see what we're doing in the world of SDN. So um, again, um, Obviously, I'm doing the talking here, but, but Craig, my colleague here, has been very involved in pretty much all the projects we're doing in the SDN space. <coughs> and I'm, what I want to briefly talk in the 15, 20 minutes given to me is um, SDN's been around um, for quite a while now. OpenFlow and, and you know, other protocols have been uh, there for a while. Um, this is by no means meant to be a tutorial on SDN or OpenFlow. It's really a call to action as to actually do something practical because it is a fairly disruptive new ecosystem. So that being said, let's proceed. All I do is press the green button, is that correct? Am I supposed to point it somewhere? Yeah, just keep pressing the red 
Oh, the big one. There's two green buttons here. And it's, all right, that's it. <coughs> all right, wonderful. So briefly, I'll very briefly talk about what is SDN and why, but, but I'm guessing you've you know, heard enough of it over the last few years. Um, where is it doing well, and, and what are some of the pain points around SDN? And uh, you know, the focus of a lot of our work has been really around the, the easy wins, the quick wins, things where we can actually get something up and going quickly so that you actually see what the benefits are. Because yes, you can see a lot of PowerPoint and slides about the benefits and pros and cons of SDN, but it really doesn't sink in until you do it yourself and, and get what you want out of it uh, rather than what you see in presentations and the likes. Um, and briefly talk about what are some of the next steps for SDN. So I, I'm pressing the big button this time. Right. <coughs> so um, I actually worked in industry after my PhD. I was sick of being in academia. I said enough of research and paper writing. I want to do something real. Um, I got my PhD in, in California. So Silicon Valley was close by. Joined a startup. I said I want a very early stage startup. I was the third person on board. We raised $60 million. We went on for you know three years almost. Burnt all that money. Had a lot of fun. Um, and in the process, I developed a, a shitload of code, right? I was cutting code yeah, every 18 hours of the day. The joke in our company was we are very flexible. You can pick any 18 hours of the day to work. Um, <coughs> I wrote um, everything from network processor code to, you know, spanning tree protocols, the, um, the basic spanning tree, spanning forest, rapid spanning tree. I wrote, you know, RIP, OSPF, parts of BGP and the likes. And am I supposed to do something to keep this on? or? Press the big button again? Yeah. yeah. All right, so, um, <coughs> and it's interesting because I had studied at university about routing protocols and I had learned about Dijkstra's algorithm. That's what we study in OSPF. I said, great, I'm gonna implement that. <coughs> and if you've seen RFC 2328, which is the OSPF, you know, the classic John Moy specification, uh, there's about three pages of Dijkstra in there. The other 180 pages are about state management making sure you're flooding the LSAs, making sure it's consistent, making sure you put checksums and all that stuff. So, I mean, the takeaway from that is that the protocols we implement that are distributed <coughs> spend an inordinate amount of effort actually trying to keep state consistent. We really end up spending a little time on the actual intellectual bit, which is the actual algorithm that does the routing or the tree computation or whatever it is. And, and that's a bit of a shame because that effort is replicated across protocols. So that's where you know, SDN tries to address that pain point and say, can we actually get rid of the state management overhead with every single protocol and actually focus our efforts on doing it once, doing it properly, so it's logically centralized, and then you can actually focus on the intellectual bits, which is the algorithm that you really want to run, be it for traffic engineering or security or whatever it is. So <clears throat> in some sense, OpenFlow is an abstraction, um, which says, when a packet comes, you gotta match on a bunch of fields and you gotta take an action. As simple as that, right? It's a very abstract notion um, and yet incredibly powerful. I mean, it has lots of benefits, of course, and I've seen this in other slides. I'm not gonna re reiterate, but separating the, the control and management plane from the data plane. And that's fairly key, which means you can actually use switches from multiple vendors, provided they follow this match action kind of paradigm. Um, <coughs> so that's all great in theory. How can we put it to use? And so let's, let's look at, um, uh, I mean, it has been successful in certain domains, but not necessarily as successful in certain others. So, you know, we looked at it about four or five years back, thanks to Josh, who kind of, you know, uh, brought us into the fold with SDN. And we said, what are some of the use cases we can tackle? Um, and we decided, well, let's try to get our hands dirty. We're not going to go and change the whole network. Nobody's going to do that. Not going to happen. What can we do? given our limited resources, right? Um, uh, and, and we want to kind of dip our foot in the, toe, uh, in, the, in, the, in the water and see what we can come up with. And the very first thing we said is like, yeah, the, my biggest pain point is my house. I got two kids. I got about 20 devices in my house. Sometimes the damn light keeps on blinking. I don't know who's doing what. And I have to go around the house checking. And you know, are you doing something? Why is my you know, Skype teleconference not working? It was so damn annoying. So we said, okay, let's try to see. <coughs> what we can do in, our, in my own house uh, with SDN. So we took, I mean, I took my home gateway. I didn't want to go and buy a new one. You know, I'm, I'm cheap, I'm an academic, uh, don't get paid enough and all that. So, so I said, let's reflash this. I don't want to write any code for the home router. You know, frankly, you know, we've done that. You write little bits here and there, you change it tomorrow, it's gone. Uh, where do you back it up, all that kind of stuff. So let's try to use the SDN paradigm. So we put OpenFlow 
on the, on the home device. <coughs> and we said, right, now what can we do? So we said, all right, so uh, instead of going and running out and buying one of those fancy gadgets and including the Google, you know, um, on hub and whatnot, that will set you back two or three hundred dollars, if not more. I'm cheap. I keep my home gateway. I reflash it. Make sure I put a VS so I have an open flow agent. And then we put our apps <coughs> in the cloud. Now, if it is at all possible to flip to the demo, which I was hoping to do on my Mac and show you everything happening in my house, then that would have been wonderful. In the absence of it, unfortunately, I'll have to resort to PowerPoint. But I, I guarantee you I'll be able to show it in the demo um, at some point today. So we built this infrastructure where we have open flow in the form of OBS on the home router. You know, we put some <coughs> basically controller in the cloud so that we could push and you know, uh, push rules, open flow rules, and read counters and all that kind of stuff. Uh, built an orchestrator on top, and then put a user interface on top with a web portal, which, if the demo works, I should be able to show you. Look, maybe it's just too much of a pain given that I'm running out of time. Um, we'll just skip the demo, just stick to the slides, that's fine. I'll do the demo outside. And as a user, all I do is just, I log into a portal, right? And that portal is essentially interacting with uh, my orchestrator, which is interacting with the controller, which then talks to my home router. Um, first thing, bingo, I can see the devices in my house. Amazing. How come after having had, you know, 25 years of internet in my home, no vendor has been able to give me this? It just boggles the mind. And by the way, all of this stuff has been built initially by students. Uh, that being said, you know, Yes, you know, companies like Google have fantastic employees, but they've got to pay them a shitload of money. The advantage of being a student, and I'm talking because I know there's a lot of university audience here, is our best asset are students, who we don't pay, they pay us to come work for us, right? <laughs> that, that is the asset that you got to tap into, because if you think you're going to pay somebody, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to come and do SDN for you, you're not gonna, never going to get the blessings. So essentially, I didn't spend a cent on this. I didn't even buy a new router, for heaven's sake. A student reflashed it for me and got everything working, right? <clears throat> First thing, I get visibility into my home. I have the devices, names on the left. We pick up the DHCP name, but hey, I can go in and change the name. If I log into the portal, I can call it Apple TV. I can call it whatever I want. I map it to a user. All very intuitive. You can just type the name there. I can see the MAC address, when last seen, and I can even give it a color. Now, our color selections are pretty bad, but we're working on that, right? I can then <coughs> go and see my usage. Live, last hour, last day, last week. So if I had my laptop here working and displaying, I'd have shown, because my younger son is sick today and at home, and my wife, I could have shown you what they're doing in the sense of how much usage on which machine is happening in my house right now. Now, this is showing a breakup of usage for your home. This is over the last seven days. Um, great visibility. What do I do with it? <coughs> Believe it or not, a provider in, in Iran came to us and said, damn, this is exactly what I want, because I get five gigabytes of quota for my subscribers per month, because international connectivity, Iran, we've been in sanctions for years. That's all I can give my customers. And they, their kids burn it up in the first week. And then I get these angry customer calls saying, how the hell is that possible? I couldn't have burnt up my five gig. This is what I want to show them. Your kid on that device in pink there is watching videos. Go fix that problem. It's in your house. It's not us. Right? So it is actually being used by an operator in Iran today. Right? And he's, yes, he's only given it to a small number of customers, less than 100. But they are his most painful customers who call him them every month complaining. They said, just here's the route. Just you can go to the portal and see for yourself what the hell is happening in your house. Right? Fantastic. <clears throat> then we go out and and put quotas. Little, we, from an open flow point of view, you put one rule matching the MAC address of the device for the way out and for the way in. You can count the bytes for each device in your house. Then you can go and put quotas against users. So I've limited my two kids, and oh, I, I'm, the guest is not showing. I just added that a few weeks back. Um, so I can limit what my the volume I give to my kids. Now I have fairly unlimited quotas, so it's not a big deal, but. I could easily put time of day. I could restrict them in any way I want, really. Right? But the concept is so simple that you can build interfaces, whatever you want, on top in the cloud so that I can even change my home router. It doesn't matter. My configs are not lost. Um, and then we went ahead. <coughs> and, uh, and we dropped this app, by the way, just about a few months back, which is to do parental controls. Essentially, we take a copy of the DNS packets, send it off to, a, to our server in the cloud. That looks at all the DNS, makes some calls to open DNS, gets tags. 
And you know, I can see for my two kids how many moderate and MA sites and restricted sites they are, they are accessing over the last hour, last day, last week, and even in real time. I can do searches there. I can see, you know, my kid is not allowed to play games on weekdays, only weekends. I just do a search on what's the latest game he's playing, um, Clash of Clans. I can do a search there, and it'll tell me when is the last time he accessed Clash of Clans and the likes. So I can keep an eye. And we don't at the moment restrict them. We just monitor. But restriction can be added if needed, right? So <coughs> and we have a very active project. I think uh, Philip mentioned IoT security. So we have actually done a whole line of work. We do analytics of the traffic without looking at every packet, to look at flow patterns and DNS traffic. And if your smoke alarm is starting to talk to a ch server in China, we want to raise a flag there. Right? So these kind of things are, are being done. And the beauty is this IoT security app is not deployed yet, but we'll deploy it in the cloud. No customer premises equipment has to be changed or forklifted. They'll just log in the next day and see a new app that's available to them. Right? So that's the beauty of SDN. So that product, we started as a prototype, built for free with students, has actually become a product now, is being used by a carrier in some part of the world. Right? <coughs> a second use case is video telemetry. We talked to a bunch of carriers around, <coughs> and they said, oh, you know, Netflix is our biggest pain point, and we have our own content, video content services, and yeah, we get aggregate numbers, how much Netflix is being watched at peak time, but we really don't know how many people are watching Netflix. What quality is that Netflix running at? Heck, we don't know why we are ranked there in Netflix, wherever we are, you know, one or two or three or whatever it is. And, <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we pay, you know, a few hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're trying to get some deep packet inspection boxes and yada, yada, yada. We said, you know what? Don't waste your time. Let's build it for you. So that's what, exactly what we did. <clears throat> we built a pure white box based solution, um, which again we can demonstrate to you today. Essentially, the switch is open flow based, and we, we make the hardware. Uh, so, essentially, the basic idea is we'll copy some packets into software and identify is it Netflix, is it YouTube, is it whatever else, you know, Twitch or whatever it is, but not all packets into software. <clears throat> so the trick really here is to balance what you look at software and what you look at hardware. So the hardware will mirror some packets, but when there are long flows going on, it doesn't mirror all packets to the software. That's, that's downright stupid, right? And frankly, more than 60% of internet traffic is video streaming that's going on for quite a long time. Once I've seen the first few packets, thank you, but I don't want to see the rest of the packets. I know what it is, right? So we put flow table entries in the hardware so that the software doesn't get bombarded with all packets. Only about 10 to 20% of packets actually need to go to software. At the same point, we don't want to insert a flow entry for every short flow in the network, every web page browsing. So we make sure those flow mods don't need to get pushed back into the hardware. So the hardware, and because of the fact that 90% of flows in the internet are really short, um, our hardware does not need to change its entries too often. So essentially, many flows in the network are actually short flows. You don't want to change the hardware table entries. But the volume of traffic is mostly carried in long flows, which you don't want to give to software. Right? So by using this balance and, and tuning that carefully, depending on your traffic mix, we can achieve very scalable performance. <coughs> and once we have identified the long flows, in our case at the moment anything longer than 10 seconds, we then look at the profile of the traffic by looking at the counters every second. And based on the profile, we have done some machine learning to identify this is YouTube, this is Netflix, this is Twitch, and we have identified 25 other providers, a lot of them coming from China that are being used on our campus, which even our IT didn't know. Right? So you get a nice dashboard. You can see you know, volumes of traffic per provider, per content provider. You can see the most recent flows. You can see how long it's been going, what's the resolution, what's the rate, and so on and so forth. And <coughs> UNSW was. You know, IT was very helpful. They gave us a feed of the whole DOM traffic. And we did a profile over the month of May. And this is all live at that, um, at that web page, which, again, we won't do due to lack of time. But we could show them that 44% of your traffic is, of video traffic is YouTube, so much Facebook, Twitch, Netflix, and so on and so forth. And there's 23% others, which includes UNSW's own video service. Mm, it's actually not very popular within UNSW, apparently. Um, <coughs> But we could identify about 25 video uh, providers who our campus had no idea about. All this is done. Uh, and by the way, as of two weeks back, we now have a feed of the campus, full campus traffic. So we are trying to scale this up to beyond 10 gigs. Um, at the moment, it's working at 10 gig. You can get not just the breakup of which content provider. You can get the 
by day, by time of day, you can get the resolutions. You can even get to see how long people watch a video stream. And if you look at these distributions, um, the black lines Twitch and pink line Netflix, they are watched for much longer than Facebook or YouTube uh, flow. So these kind of statistics, we have very detailed statistics on video viewing patterns on campus, which if our campus wanted to do, they'd probably have to buy some DPI boxes and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. This was built homegrown software, white box hardware, dirt cheap solution, gives you as much if not better visibility than a lot of DPI boxes. Um, and it is also actually being trialed by a provider right now. Um, so that was the second use case. And the third use case, which I think due to lack of time, am I down to five minutes? Um, <coughs> yeah. OK, so the third use case is around interconnects. And, and, and Craig here is the expert on them, and he's happy to show you a demo today. An interconnect is basically a place where many domains, autonomous systems, or customers essentially meet, and they exchange traffic. And the architecture is very simple. In the data plane, there's a layer to switch that exchanges the traffic. And then in the control plane, there's a BGP speaker, speaker in the form of a root server or a pair of root servers. Everybody peers with them, exchanges their routing table information, and so on. Very conceptually simple architecture, but it comes with a lot of pain points. People can send multicast and broadcast traffic into the fabric. That can bring your fabric down. Op storms, because they're, it's a layer to switch, op is a, is a broadcast, will go to everybody, and it can affect your uh, fabric. And in fact, exchanges like the Amsterdam Exchange run things called op sponges to reduce the op traffic. <clears throat> Frankly, all those are hacks, right? If you really could start with a clean slate, you'd say, if I'm at an exchange and arping for a certain other autonomous system, another domain, why on earth do you need to flood that ARP request? I know exactly where it's meant to go. And the beauty with SDN is you can actually make it, you can enforce it. You can actually force the ARP request to go unicast to the particular entity you're ARPing for. Because there are customers connected on different ports, you really don't need to flood that or broadcast that uh, ARP request. <clears throat> That's just hygiene. But also, um, you can get telemetry. We are talking to exchange operators. Many of them don't even know how much traffic is being exchanged by each of their customers which, with each of their other customers. Um, <clears throat> They just don't have the telemetry. With SDN and OpenFlow, you get the counters for free. You can actually build nice telemetry tools, and we'll be happy to show you some of them that we have. Um, the other big problem is that what you announce in the BGP domain um, in the control plane may not be what is happening in the data plane. I'm connecting to the exchange. I advertise a prefix. In the control plane, that sounds OK. But in the data plane, you send me traffic to a prefix that I never advertised. Unless I put filters, I will accept the traffic and give you a free service. With SDN, we can actually correlate the control plane and the data plane. What you advertise in your BGP session to me as the exchange, I will put rules to only accept traffic from those prefixes and only send you traffic to those prefixes if you're a, let's say, for example, if you're a stub AS. And we use this exact same principle to also do IP source address spoof protection <coughs> and to implement geoblocking. So imagine if you're running a census server, just hypothetically, and you want to restrict the service to Australia, it's very clear what you want to do. You want to find all the prefixes in Australia, and you want to put rules in there to say nothing but these prefixes are allowed to access this particular service. With, with OpenFlow and SDN, it's a piece of cake, really, conceptually. Of course, there's still the implementation of the software, but conceptually, it's very doable. In fact, we demonstrated this just about three months back at Eurosys. So the point is these are use cases where you can actually start from basic principles. What do you actually want to do? And as Philip said, the application that you want from the network, it's not just, I want connectivity. Yeah, we're well past those days. I really want a service. In my home, I actually want to know what devices are connected, how much they're using, are my kids doing, you know, going to unsafe sites. In my enterprise, I want to know what video is happening, which providers, how long are people watching video, is the quality changing at peak hour or not, and how often is my Netflix stream adapting its rate. Um, and in the exchange point, you really want to make sure you're enforcing security in, the, in terms of stopping your IP address being spoofed and the likes. If you think from first principles, these are actually simple problems. But if you start with today's vendor solutions, they are very difficult problems. Because for everything, you have to craft a very special solution that puts ACLs here and messes around with this here and puts ARP sponges there and whatnot. So <clears throat> for us, SDN has been conceptually very appealing. But then we are academics, hey. We like very simple and appealing solutions. Um, and they are implementable. And we have done a lot of these at very low cost 
yes, we're a university, and we get a lot of free labor, and very, very talented labor. Um, but it's not just an academic exercise. Of the three things I've shown you today, two are commercial products that are actually being used by carriers out there. And the third one, which is the, the video monitoring, uh, we are in the process of trying to spin that out um, as a product. And yes, we will compete with all the DPI boxes out there, one-tenth the cost, parity on features, and much more. That's my guarantee, or that's my belief at least. So that being said, um, <clears throat> I'll skip to the next, uh, I think I believe is a, is, a, is a killer use case for SDN, and that's security. Um, and that's been talked about before, and I'm sure it's going to be talked about more in a, as we go through the day. And that's where I think... Uh, Security is a fantastic use case because you want to be agile, you want to adapt, it's not going to be a static set and forget. And that's where you want to combine looking into traffic, network profiles, patterns, doing machine learning, finding out what's going wrong and going back and changing the posture of your network. And all this requires very dynamic and agile you know, identification, visibility and reaction to the security threat. And that's what we are building now. Very early stages, we just started this year. <coughs> but. Uh, I think Craig might be happy to spin up a little half-working kind of demo for you just to show what the possibilities are. Right, it was working at 6 p.m. last night, so it's nice and warm out of the oven. Uh, you're welcome to have a look at it in our demo booth. Um, and it's bringing together a lot of components, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, switches and uh, uh, the Bro Packet Inspection Engine, again, open source, and Fawcett, which you'll hear about next. Um, and a lot of analytics and machine learning. So, and we are applying this to regular traffic, but also specifically to IoT traffic, because the profiles of IoT traffic are quite different to regular devices. So, <clears throat> that being said, I'll just uh, conclude by saying that, uh, now, SDN has been talked about a lot for the last, you know, six to eight years. Um, the only way to learn it is not from PowerPoint, but really doing it. And I know sometimes it can be difficult and daunting because it requires new skills. It's a very complex ecosystem, very fragmented between you know, vendors of hardware and software and platforms and controllers and apps and the likes. But the only way to get to see what it can do is to get your hands dirty and do it. Pick the use cases that are low risk. I mean, the lowest risk is when you take a tap of the traffic and just use SDN for visibility. Yes, you may not trust SDN in the path of your traffic yet, but that's okay. Our university has been very generous, given us a tap of the whole traffic in the, on campus, and we are showing them fantastic things which they're getting value out of, all at zero cost pretty much from their point of view. And it's great fun for us to play around with. Um, and again, tap into the asset that you have at the university. You have an incredible amount of talent that pays to come and work for you. So use that effectively. There will be failures. Not everything you do will be, succeed, will be a success, and we have had lots of failures. I'm only talking about the successes we have had, but that's okay when you actually have that big talent pool that you really don't need to pay much um, to keep working on these kind of things. So if you find the right set of use cases where the risk is managed, um, copies of traffic are good, and you have the talent pool, you really, uh, now is the time to get up and actually do things in SDN. Uh, before it's too late and before it starts getting into uh, highly packaged solutions that vendors would want to sell to you. So uh, I'll stop with that. Thanks. <laughs>